Hey, um, basically I just wanted to say I'm sorry for being so late. It won't happen again. Uh, even if you guys don't really enjoy this video, uh, I got another one going out probably very, very soon after. I will try my best to get back to a more consistent schedule, but, uh, yeah. Hope you guys enjoy this. Holy crap, this game is better than I imagined. When I saw this in my local game store for a $10 price tag, I had a passive relationship with Hyrule Warriors. I remember the original Wii U game coming out and the 3DS game coming soon after. I genuinely made fun of it for trying to port a Wii U game to the 3DS, but then I turned around and gave Nintendo my money for Mario Maker 3DS. That, Pokés and Gentlemen, is called hypocrisy. While I still think that the 3DS game would be weird due to the lack of uh, rear trigger buttons, I never bought it. After my first video that nobody watched, Seriously, go watch it. I worked really hard on it. I was done with it about only about eight hours more of playtime. Then I was craving more. I knew the Definitive Edition was a thing, and it was $10 off, how perfect, at my local Walmart. And geez, look at that hour count. Granted, I did do a little bit more in this game because, well, there is more in this game, but I digress. This game is harder than the other one, and that's due to one mechanic, switching during battle. This version adds a new amount of strategy to the mix by allowing you to switch between up to five characters in some cases while mid-battle. If you don't master commanding the characters you don't control right at that moment, you'll lose. On top of that, the difficulty has been raised from what I can tell. So not only will this review be a review of the Definitive Edition, but also somewhat of a comparison to its Wii U counterpart, at least what's similar between the two. If you've played a Dynasty Warriors game before, then you've played a version of Hyrule Warriors. I assume Fire Emblem Warriors is the same way. There are actually two control styles of Hyrule Warriors. Warriors control style and Zelda control style. Personally, I prefer Warriors due to the ease of everything orbiting around the attack buttons. The gameplay of Hyrule Warriors consists of battling thousands of enemies and taking keeps to proceed through the battle. You take keeps by defeating enough enemies to lure the keep bosses out. Sometimes keeps require you to defeat a specific enemy, character, or boss to take it. Big enemies, characters, and bosses have what you call a weak point gauge. If you hit an enemy quick enough, the right amount of times, you will unleash a devastating weak point attack. But I'm not done yet! Just like in Dynasty Warriors, the warrior of your choice is a yellow special attack gauge that's filled by fighting enemies. Some characters will have a second gauge that either increases attack power for a time, or when full, can unleash a devastating attack when the strong attack button is used. Finally, every character has a magic bar that can be used to activate either your fairy, uh, more on that later, or on focus energy. Focus energy nullifies knockback and breaks all guards. If you wait till the energy runs out, you unleash an effect that does above average damage. There's nothing to write home about. However, if you press the special attack button before your magic bar is empty, you unleash a devastating focus attack that can be used to instantly knock down a boss without needing to exploit their weakness to show their weak point gauge. There are combos that you can unlock by progressing your badge tree. You perform these combos by pressing the light attack button, the heavy attack button in correct succession. For example, keep in mind, this is in the warrior style, not the Zelda style. Y, 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 X is a combo. Y, Y, X is a combo. And Y, Y, X, X is also a combo. And so on and so forth. You progress by collecting materials from defeating certain enemies and collecting little pouches. There are three different types, bronze, silver, and gold and each are used for certain parts of a, of a badge or elixirs. Elixirs are in the apothecary and give you boosters. Badges aren't just for combat upgrades, however. There are defense and assist badges. Defense badges allow you to use your warrior to drink potions for health, get more health and hearts, and all fight knockback, increase every other defense in certain areas. <sighs> assist badges make keeps fall faster, and also increase your power up time. <sighs> all right. All of this is done in the bazaar. The bazaar is where a badge market, apothecary, training dojo, where you pay rupees to level up a character, saving grinding time, thank god, and the smithy. The smithy is where you confuse weapons with their skills to weapons that have empty skill slots, which that might sound confusing, but once you look at it, it really isn't. You can make those skills better or sell the weapons for more rupees. This is the basic, very basic, and yes, I said basic gist of the gameplay. The non-specific basic gameplay. There's a lot more to cover, so on to the next subject. So, I decided to do a top 5 uh, and bottom 5 style. A similar video with a different intro and outro will be up on Wildcard separately. So, without further ado, let's start, the five, top, let's start with the top 5 characters list thing. 
I don't know. <laughs> Let's start off with the dishonorable mentions. King Defines, King Defines, whatever you want to call it. It's a bit too slow, but he hits hard. Now, onto the list. Number five, five. Not bad, just kind of mediocre. Her attacks are flashy, but not very functional. Whenever I have to use her, I'm spending way more time on a singular enemy because, because even at a high level, the enemies are still too good. Sure, it's easy to combo them to infinity, but still. Number four, Twidely Midna. Too slow. Attacks are weird and hitboxes seem off. In tight corridors and indoor spaces, it can be hard to see where all the enemies are in relation to your hitboxes. However, the, uh, the damage output is pretty good, so I can't complain too much. Number three, Agatha. Not really much to say. Decent combos, but low damage. She's more or less Fi again, but slower, and it isn't easy as com to combo the enemy to Timbuktu. Number two, Wizro. Too slow again. Long range, but almost no damage is done to the target. His attacks are by far the weakest out of all the villain characters. But I don't hate Wizro as much as number one. Number one, Sia. Jeez, Sia is... Not only do I hate her outfit, but she is way too OP. Once you unlock her full Kok Kokiri Sword Tree, which is the easiest for me to unlock, you can just mash Y and not even move and kill anything in your path. Seriously, like, what is the point of this character? I get that, like, you have to use her a, a lot, so why not make her good? But at the same time, like, this is completely overpowered. The did they even test this character at all? Alright, with the trash taken out, let's talk about the good stuff. I have one honorable mention, Tingle. Tingle was the easiest overall skill tree for me at least, and I love his attacks because they're just so goofy. And his weapon is called Rosie Balloon. Nice. Anyway, let's get on with the list. Alright, number five, Sheik. A fast character with low range and damage. Sheik hits multiple times with fury and speed. Bit easier for bosses, but I still have fun with Sheik. Number four, Volga. Dragon Spear, Dragon Combos, Dragon Knight. This man needs some credit. When I use him, he becomes a powerhouse and a force to be reckoned with. Not even joking. I can be anything that comes in my way and tear through them whenever I need to. Number three, Zant. Combo's are really funny with some weird noises. He also has one of those secondary bars that allows you to add more damage on top of the already done to the enemy during combos. He's fun to play, and I mean it. He, he just... Wow. <laughs> Number two, Linkle. Awesome crossbow with... Bombs? Fast and balanced, and you actually have to work to be powerful with combos and skill upgrades. Honestly, I expected to hate Linkle, and I used to. But after playing as Linkle for all of her campaign, all of my hate has been moved to Sia. Not even kidding. Alright, you saw this one coming. Number one is Link. Link is completely awesome. He's snappy and balanced. You have to work to become the overpowered mess that he can become. Not only does the ease of leveling help due to how often you use him, no, 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 no. It's also because his combos are amazing and he's his unique spin move after all of his combos that can be devastating. He also has the best variety of weapons and arguably the best weapon in the game. I'll give you one guess of what it is. Comparison. This section will be short. I'll be comparing stuff from the base Wii U game with similar content in this version. Aside from the story, more on next segment, and some graphical stuff, there are stark contrasts between the base Wii U content and the same segments in the Switch version. For starters, both the Wii U and Switch versions are graphically vibrant and detailed. However, the Switch version is superior because it runs at 60 FPS versus 30. <laughs> It's funny guys because mine can only my capture card can only capture at 30 why on on a handheld no less this will this just helps a little bit more if i'm being perfectly honest anyway the gameplay despite being similar are vastly different due to being able to switch in command this allows you to send a character to a spot to fight a boss to, through the pause menu while you handle foes elsewhere it can also be used to guard your allied base or even fast travel speaking of fast travel there's a new ocarina item that allows you to warp to any owl statue activating it Compare this to the Wii U. You have to do all of this manually. If you want to backtrack, instead of being able to switch, or in some cases warp back, nope, you've got to run back and hope you get back in time before this mess is all over. If you're allied base, keep in mind, 
the most important keep to your side, by the way, is attacked, you have to rush back to save it. Plus, you can't re re rely on your allies to fight to save your bacon. You'll just get squashed. This shows the difference between fake and genuine difficulty. The Wii U one is harder because your allies are idiots and you don't move quickly enough to save yourself, while the Switch one is hard because you have to rely on your scale and strategy to get you by. If you lose, it's because you messed up, not... No! But what does the Wii U have that the Switch doesn't? The gamepad! What is it? What use with it was lost? Uh, no. It had no use. Even, like, the amiibo support was brought over with the Joy-Cons. Uh, what else is different? Conquering Hyrule. Yes, my little monster. Kill him! <laughs> yes. Now it's time to make my own murder army. <laughs> Obviously, this section will have spoilers, so click to the time stamp if you care. Alright, we're good. There are four stories. The main story, Linkle's Tale, Sia's Tale, and Wind Waker. We'll go in order. First, the main story. I'll be doing a very basic breakdown of the story. I'll talk about locations and big characters and facts. Okay, so we end up with a horde of monsters attacking Hyrule Castle. Link is simply a trainee that Zelda notices his skill. She soon after notices initiative when he jumps in to help the kingdom with an extraordinary skill. Link meets up with Volga, and after he protects Impa with his, with his Triforce powers, Volga flees. You kill King Dodongo and Zelda goes missing. The search is on. You then get trapped in Elden Caves where you meet Sheik, a mysterious youth, which if you've played a Zelda game you know exactly who that is. Sheik helps you out of the cave and you head to Farron Woods. In the Farron Woods you meet up with Lana who's leading a resistance. Lana is a sorceress who holds a magic book to attack. She's actually really fun to play, to be honest. She helps you get to Sia, the original guardian of the Triforce, who let Ganon take over because of her love for Link. You go into a valley of seers to confront her, and she had opened portals to different times and different dimensions. Impa and Sheik went to Death Mountain, which is where we learned that Sheik is actually Zelda. Ooh, it's been around since Ocarina of Time. Then to the Water Temple to defeat Sia's forces in the era of Ocarina of Time, as well as recruit them. Lana goes to Twilight Princess's version of Hyrule Field, then to the Twilight Realm, recruiting Bina and Ap Agatha and defeating Xant, who Sia recruited in her story. The Twilight Realm is also where we first learn that Lana is Sia's other half, technically. Finally, Link goes to Sky Skyloft to defeat Giraham, who Sia also recruited, and he recruited Fi. After that, the crew goes, on, uh, goes after the Master Sword, but Wizard attacks them. You obliterate him and his forces after you retrieve the Master Sword. The group heads to the Temple of Souls where uh, uh, Link learns the importance of friendship and they all head to the Valley of Seers where they defeat Sia. Bring peace to Hyrule for good. Psych, I fooled you boys! I never met Ganondorf, you imbeciles! We then play as Ganondorf for three chapters where he regroups and takes over Hyrule again. Those chapters were hard, like really hard, it required a lot of command and switching and whatever. Finally, you have two more chapters to finish, one in Gerudo Desert where you regroup like Ganon did, and then immediately head back to the twisted version of Hyrule Castle to defeat Ganon. The final boss uses everything from the other bosses. It's pretty challenging due to the amount of health. It's it's neat. Like I did before my Starlink reveal, I'll rate these out of 10. I would give the main campaign a 10 out of 10 when compared to the others because it's a length and amount of characters amazing bosses. Its premise is simple, but there were a lot more nuances that I couldn't even go into here because it would be 10 hours long in which I won't spoil them because they're one of the best parts of the experience. It was more or less just a good excuse to, uh, you know, get awesome battles in because, yeah, the story's neat, but the battles are even neater. Linkle's story is pretty simple. She hears the castle's under attack, and but she gets lost. You go to Farron Woods first, beat up Skull Kid because he stole your grandpa, gra grandpa's? No. Because he stole your grandma's magic compass. Then you go to Skyloft the next only help Fi beat giant demons that are instead mini giant demons. You go to Lake Hy Hylia and accidentally help Rudo, then finally meet Twilight Midna to find out more about your compass. Finally, you fight one last hurrah to save Hyrule when Zelda and Link travel to return the Master Sword. 8 out of 10. Only really fun because it's Linkle, otherwise it would be too short. Speaking of... No! Finally, Wind Waker. Uh, worlds collide again? Lana goes missing? 
everything goes back to normal. Okay, I got nothing. You, you get the harem power up, which is barely useful, even when given a power up. It doesn't... I don't even remember what this one, to be honest. It, it's just kind of there. I don't even really have a rating, so I guess it's harmless. It's nothing to rant and rate over, though. It's pretty short, pretty painless. Overall, the story is just simplistic with good dialogue, but the battles and gold sculptures are just so awesome that I can't give them too bad ratings. So enjoy those. Extra modes. There are a few extra modes in the Definitive Edition, all of which I really love. There's an Adventure Mode, different from Legend Mode, which is Story Mode, Challenge Mode, and the, uh, My Fairy Mode. Anyway, Adventures Mode is comparable to Spirit Mode in Smash Ultimate. They're themed, sometimes bite-sized battles that give you items, whether that be new costumes, new weapons, or even new characters, some unavailable unless you play through this mode, like Deadly Skull Kid or Full Twilight Midnight. You go around different maps doing said battles, getting items and characters, that's pretty much it. It's fun, simple mode to help you get more characters, costumes, and weapons. That's it, I like it a lot. The challenge mode is very similar to that new Super Mario Bros. U. Remix battles under specific categories. There are three categories. Battle challenge, boss challenge, again, and fury. Battle challenge is just like those in adventure mode, where you just, you know, you, you kill a certain amount of enemies. Boss challenge is where you kill several big bosses at once, and again, fury is a bit of both. This made me just feel like the mode is bare. It's, it's basically adventure mode without the charm of a map and rewards. It's just kind of there. Sure, there are unique challenges like killing seven King Dodongos at once, but that doesn't necessarily make it worth it to me. My fairy mode is where you dress up a fairy and level up skills to help you out in battle. I find it almost useless because I almost never die in battle, just because I'm that cool. It, it's simple, and at least for me, useless. Conclusion. Overall, this game was amazing. I had a lot of fun with it. Honestly, I don't know which I love more, Starlink or Hyrule Warriors. I guess it's what I'm in the mood for. If I want to resource totally management amazing. based because it's for a space shooter, them awesome. I choose Starlink. More. If I want a fast-paced hack and slash in the Zelda universe, I choose Hyrule Warriors. I would say that the quality is on par with Starlink, and I got the same amount of level of enjoyment with it. 9.5 out of 10. <laughs> wow, this review was so hard to make, guys, and once again, this game blows Sonic Generations out of the park. Well, maybe we should give it another fair shot. I would once again like to apologize that this is late. Um, this was a ginormous script, so please don't don't hurt me.